Thank you very much. Uh, so I think my micro is also working, right? OK. You can take off your mask if you want. I, I will prefer not. Okay. <laughs> um, Yes, so uh, let me uh, introduce the motivations for this title, uh, which uh, sounds a, a bit uh, maybe mysterious uh, at first sight. So uh, I would, I'm going to start with a preliminary thoughts about what is uh, the setting uh, for uh, studying and assessing the quality of a parallel in time scheme. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to start by defining, I mean, uh, an evolution problem, basically. So I introduce a, a banner space U. Uh, this sounds very fancy, but uh, think about H1 or think something like this. And suppose we are searching for a solution U uh, in C1 of uh, zero T U, a solution to a certain evolution problem for a given uh, initial time. So. The task in uh, all parallel in time schemes is to build an approximation of the solution uh, such that we can run it in parallel and the parallel efficiency is the best possible, right? The parallel efficiency defined as when I run my algorithm sequentially and I divide it, I look at the ratio between this and the runtime in parallel with n processors and I divide here by 1 over n, so this has to be as close to 1 as possible. And uh, I would like to add here something else, which is that we often tend to forget this, but uh, this efficiency has to be measured with respect to some target accuracy of the solution. And because here when we do the comparison, when we uh, run our code sequentially, it is going to deliver us a certain target accuracy. And in order the comparison to be fair, the uh, algorithm in parallel has also to deliver the same accuracy. Otherwise, we are not comparing uh, comparable things. Therefore, for I am going to add this notion of accuracy and for any given target accuracy, the approximation that we are going to build with the sequential or the parallel algorithm, it has to be such that the error over all times has to be smaller than eta. Of course, one can define all the notions of quality here instead of taking the max, I can take an average uh, in time or uh, uh, t take the measure of quality that you prefer, but we need to define a measure of quality that every algorithm that we are going to use has to satisfy in order for things to be comparable. Uh, then next, uh, we have uh, heard uh, during this week uh, several different paradigms in order to, uh, to have strategies to uh, build uh, pine schemes. The first family of strategies, I would classify them as purely PDE driven. The first uh, strategy being probably the uh, historically the, the first one. The first ideas probably are connected to time stepping schemes. The parallel algorithm is uh, probably one of the most famous, but then there have been others like MGrid, FAST, and others. Uh, but I guess the common denominator, as far as I understand, in these uh, approaches is. Uh, the fact that they involve one way or the other a uh, time-stepping scheme. Then at the beginning of the week we have also heard strategies uh, related to preconditioners that uh, in fact they, they don't even start at the somehow the continuous level, they already start from a discretized level and uh, then there are uh, a lot of uh, tricks that we have heard about and that I am absolutely not familiar with that are going to help us uh, do the parallelization. There, I personally don't have enough understanding in order to really uh, see how performant these uh, methods are with respect to the accuracy they deliver and also the parallel efficiency that they are delivering. For, for me, it's, it's new and I, I cannot really judge their quality so far. But then uh, we have also heard uh, exciting talks, in my opinion, about exponential integrators and uh, most of them uh, based on the Cauchy integral formula. 
And for me, I think this is a very uh, promising and uh, powerful idea. And I am going to comment this uh, further in the talk because with respect to the accuracy they can provide and the parallel efficiency, at least for some classes of PDEs, I think they can be even considered as almost like a perfect solution that I personally know. Uh, one problem is that uh, for time-stepping schemes, uh, scalability is rather poor, in fact, and especially for transport-dominated problems. And one part of this talk is going to be to discuss uh, through a, a recent contribution that we have done with Ivo Made, I would like to discuss what are uh, the intrinsic limitations of uh, using these strategies uh, through the example of the parallel algorithm. But I guess the framework that we are going to present uh, can really enlighten and help understand many other approaches based on time-stepping schemes. So the second family of approaches are m what I would call mixed approaches that are uh, half PDE driven, half data driven. Sorry, I forgot to say that PDE driven, this uh, denomination is motivated by the idea that um, we only use information about the PDE itself and that's it. We don't use external data, we don't use any learning, pre-learning phase or something like that. We really do things on the flow and with the structure of the PDE. There's, I as I would like to bring up, other mixed approaches in which we involve somehow external data, external information, and uh, this is connected to the idea of model order reduction strategies based on learning generally, so model order reduction is one instance, and also uh, deep learning with uh, the, these ideas of a physically informed neural network can also be uh, um, put into, into this category. And here, in fact, the, the power of these methods with respect to parallel in time is, in my opinion, that time can be seen as a parameter. And therefore, these uh, strategies are going to build a map from parameters to the solution, which is going to be very quick. Therefore, if we are capable of building this kind of mappings, we are going to have a, what we can claim would be a perfectly parallelized uh, strategy to, to solve our problem. Of course, comes the philosophical question, can I accept these uh, strategies as a parallel in time scheme? Because where does the learning phase enter into the count of the parallel efficiency? Should I count this uh, in, 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 the, in the sequential runtime? Or am I allowed to ignore it and then if I, if I do this, then of course uh, I'll be perfectly scalable. So I guess this, as a community, I would like to, to, to bring this discussion because uh, it's, um, it's already in the air somehow. And uh, so uh, probably depending on the application, one can accept it as a parallel in time approach or not. So after having said all these thoughts, uh, here's a roadmap of the talk. Uh, in fact, uh, it's going to be a miscellaneous talk and um, about my thoughts and experience regarding the fundamental limits of parareal. Therefore, uh, this taken as a, an example of time-stepping schemes, which are extremely popular in our community. What are, in my view, in my experience, the, the limitations? And what are the, meri the merits and limitations of alternative promising paradigms? And the paradigms that I consider promising at this stage are paradigms in which we see time as a parameter. But uh, finding this kind of uh, schemes, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not straightforward, I guess. And uh, I would like to discuss two that I know and that I'm pretty fond of. The first is going to be this uh, Cauchy integral formula for parabolic problems that has already been discussed in, uh, Martin, uh, in Martin's talk, for example. And uh, the second one, so in my view, uh, this uh, formula only qualifies for parabolic problems for the reasons I'm going to outline. And the question is going to be, if we go down this road of time as a parameter, if we are stuck with parabolic problems, what can we go to go beyond this? And for the moment, personally, one, I mean, the, the, the only approach I know uh, could somehow qualify to some extent to this 
is about reduced order modeling, which is uh, going to help us take time as a parameter, build a quick mapping to the solution, and this would somehow solve the problem, of course, uh, with the learning phase involved in it. So uh, the last part of the talk would be uh, on a recent work on uh, how to solve, in fact, uh, conservative uh, PDEs with uh, reduced order models. Okay, so um, let us uh, first uh, move to the first part of the talk on, on the merits and uh, limitations of the parallel in time algorithm. And uh, so for this, I am going to uh, summarize a, a work I recently did with Yvon Made on an adaptive uh, parallel algorithm. And uh, hopefully this uh, will uh, somehow uh, nourish the discussion about uh, the intrinsic limitations. So we've seen uh, by now uh, in many talks uh, the, the classical formulation of the parallel algorithm. It involves uh, a coarse and a fine propagator in an evolution problem. And then we iterate, we solve between zero and capital T the problem several times iteratively by propagating by chunks the coarse solver and also propagating in parallel uh, uh, in sub-intervals the fine solver. And through this uh, update rule, we are somehow building a sequence which uh, in, uh, across the iterations k is going to converge uh, to uh, the solution to the fine solver. Um, I see here what uh, motivated our work with Yvon Made was the following two major obstructions. First, the parallel efficiency is very poor. If I need capital K iterations in my algorithm, the efficiency when I, uh, when I neglect the cost of the core solver, the efficiency is one over capital K. So I need at least two iterations to consider that they have converged at the very least. So the parallel efficiency is at most 50% and usually it's under 30%, uh, three iterations. And the problem uh, of uh, this very bad efficiency, it is related to the repeated use of the fine solver across all iterations. In addition to this, in this kind of paradigm of viewing the problem in this way, in fact, there is no real online stopping criteria. We usually are cheating. We are solving uh, the, the problem with a very, very fine grid or something. And then we are comparing uh, our parallel solution to the, what we consider the true solution. Um, but so in a real scenario, that's, uh, that doesn't qualify. We, we cannot use uh, the, the, the true solution. So how can we stop our parallel iterations? And this is connected to uh, the need for a posteriori error estimators to be included in this whole pipeline in order that we first can assess the quality of uh, each new uh, update of our parallel iteration. And uh, second, once we do that, uh, when we go below a, a certain accuracy threshold, then, then we are allowed to stop. But, but we need all this information. So, so how can we include a posteriori estimators uh, to, to the whole pipeline was kind of also driving uh, the whole development that we did. And so uh, he here's uh, the way. Uh, so in order to try to answer and solve to some extent this these problems, uh, we are going to introduce a slightly different way of viewing the algorithm. For this, uh, okay, so here I have put again the kind of typical evolution we are uh, going to, to, to be considering. Uh, let me introduce this uh, E as a, a propagator. This is the, the flow that takes me from an initial condition uh, uh, at a certain initial time and then uh, it takes me to this initial time plus a certain uh, time step. This is uh, kind of uh, the, the flow operator which is exact. It's the continuous one. Uh, just in parenthesis, in order to get the continuous one we somehow need a good uh, functional framework to, to define our PDE. Uh, but so le let's assume this has been done properly. Now what I am going to introduce are approximations to this 
uh, exact flow propagator. For this, they are going to be denoted as follows. So uh, I, uh, zeta is going to be any accuracy. And then when I write this propagator E, uh, comma this uh, zeta, it means it is an approximation of this flow at uh, zeta accuracy in the sense that the error between the true propagator and the approximated propagator is bounded by zeta times a couple of other things that are just technical details. Okay, so uh, this means that I approximate the true flow E uh, at a certain accuracy z. With this kind of notation, in fact, we can reinterpret the fine solver as uh, taking the exact flow and, propagate, and propagating it with uh, accuracy z fine. The same for the core solver with an accuracy that is going to be less good. Uh, and now, so since we are in our point of view, in our paradigm, we are always kind of concerned about accuracy. In fact, I am going to view the parareal algorithm as an algorithm that uh, attempts to do the following. Uh, we take uh, macro uh, time steps, t0, t1, tn, and for these macro time steps and a certain target, a final target accuracy eta, what we want is to build with our parallel algorithm an approximation u tilde such that for all the times tn, I approximate the true solution at accuracy eta. So, um, what is going to be uh, now like the, the reformulation with a point of view of accuracy of, of the parallel algorithm? In order to define this, in fact, I, I need to introduce what, I, what we could consider the idea of the, the best parallel algorithm we can ever consider given a core solver. For this, consider this ideal parallel iterations in which it's the traditional parallel algorithm, but I have replaced the fine solver here by the exact propagator. Okay, so this is somehow it represents the best I could do if I had a certain core solver and uh, if I took as a fine solver the, the exact one. Okay, of course I cannot realize this, but let us suppose for a minute we, we consider this. This algorithm somehow uh, is going to converge to the true solution uh, and uh, it's uh, going to behave very similarly to the classical one. But now, how can, uh, in, in this, uh, with this reformulation, how can we understand now uh, the, the classical parallel algorithm? So it's uh, as if I had taken this uh, propagator and in fact I replace it by an approximation. In the classical parallel algorithm, the, the, the accuracy of approximation is fixed across iterations, but we can somehow uh, consider the idea of refining across the iterations uh, this uh, fine solver and we can try to see what happens uh, when we do this and uh, it turns out that in fact uh, and what happens when we do this and what are the minimal accuracies that I have to ask in order to still preserve convergence towards the exact solution, okay? So here if uh, across the parallel iterations I ask for an accuracy zeta k, which is tending to zero, so therefore I am approximating more and more accurately uh, the, the, the true flow. If, if I do this, uh, then I am going to resemble more and more to this kind of algorithm, and eventually, in fact, uh, if I choose correctly my accuracies, uh, this parallel algorithm is going to eventually converge to the true solution. Um, the question is just now to, to somehow discover what is the minimal accuracy, zeta k, that I need to impose at every iteration in order to preserve the convergence rate of the ideal uh, scheme. Because of course uh, I can start already extremely accurate and then refine and refine and refine. This is going to be an admissible algorithm, but 
uh, with respect to the efficiency and the cost of the fine solver, perhaps I can start coarser and then refine and refine and refine. So, so therefore the question of the minimal accuracy. Uh, and so what we can uh, somehow um, discover uh, when we when we try to, to discover these accuracies and uh, guarantee convergence is uh, the kind of uh, the, the following result. So assuming that the accuracy of our core solver is fixed to a certain zeta j, uh, sorry, so assuming that the accuracy of the core solver is this zeta j, and now assuming for a second that the cost of uh, this core solver is negligible, uh, then in fact we can prove that the parallel efficiency to uh, reach an overall accuracy of eta uh, is going to behave as uh, this uh, quantity over here. It's a 1 over 1 plus zeta j, uh, the accuracy of the core solver. Zeta j is going to be coarse but not too coarse, therefore this zeta j should be say 0, 1 or something like that. Therefore this number in principle for a, for a reasonable uh, core solver it is going to be rather close to 1. So it means that to reach any accuracy as coarse or as, or as precise as I want my algorithm is going to deliver uh, quasi-perfect parallel speed-up. So I think this is uh, very remarkable and in fact this result is going to be independent of the amount of iterations that I'm going to need in order to converge. And the reason why this is so is in fact connected to uh, this, uh, the choice of this uh, zeta k is over here. Uh, when we do the counts in fact it turns out that the cost of the first uh, propagations is going to become negligible with respect to the last propagation of the fine solver. Therefore, in the count of the parallel efficiency, it is going to be virtually as if we had used the fine solver only once. That's, uh, that's the main trick. But of course, there is a, a, a big uh, assumption here, which is that I am assuming that the cost of the core solver is negligible. So let me summarize what are the merits of this uh, algorithm and also its pitfalls. So the merits are that when I start with my fine propagations being coarse and then I refine progressively, they co I am going to end up with convergence to the exact solution. Um, we can also prove that for any target accuracy, uh, our method is going to deliver better efficiency than the plain method in which we use the fine solver very accurate from the beginning. Okay, this is kind of intuitive. Uh, the efficiency is independent of the final number of iterations. We already said this. And uh, only the cost of the last fine propagation counts because the others are negligible in cost. Uh, and uh, so this point of view also opens the door to adaptive refinements because I'm giving target accuracies at every iteration. Therefore, if I had an a posteriori error estimator, then I could use this to, to say when I have reached uh, my accuracy. So what are the problems of, of all this? So this uh, algorithm, in fact, it solves the issue of the cost of the fine solver because I am refining it uh, little by little. But the cost of the core solver, eventually, it is not going to be non-negligible in the count. And this is, now, if you use this algorithm, this is going to be the factor that is really going to spoil your parallel efficiency. And uh, this is going to be particularly the case for transport-dominated problems, where we need uh, a core solver that is actually pretty fine in order that uh, this uh, works. So um, we've seen several talks uh, on how to deal with the, course, the, the cost of the core solver. Uh, there's, for example, uh, been uh, the talk by uh, Sever in which uh, he introduces a reduced basis in order to, to deal with this. So, I mean, this kind of idea, so all that uh, decreases the cost of the core solver, 
combined uh, with uh, this adaptive approach that I have presented, I think it, it can really somehow uh, push the limits of, of the algorithm and, and improve uh, the parallel efficiency. Eventually, uh, the algorithm is uh, going to have a certain cost and uh, we are not going to get perfect parallel efficiency. And so for favorable cases, just to give you an idea, for favorable cases where the core solver is uh, really somehow close to negligible, we were obtaining speed ups of about 80%. Um, but uh, for, uh, like I would say, more normal cases, uh, the, the, the speed up uh, couldn't go beyond 50% uh, or something like that. So uh, that's the situation with the algorithm. And uh, um, let me connect this formulation maybe to other works of approaches because it's kind of an abstract framework. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, it can be connected to, to many previous works. So as we already uh, anticipated, in fact, the classical formulation is uh, w when we take uh, this uh, approximation of the exact flow at the fixed accuracy across all iterations. Uh, therefore, uh, then um, this idea of uh, refining across the iterations of fine solver, we can find it uh, in one way or the other in many previous uh, contributions. Uh, for example, the idea of coupling parallel with spatial domain decomposition is one of them. Uh, the combination of parallel with uh, iterative high order methods in time, uh, like spectral differ corrections, is another uh, type of families of strategies. Uh, it's also connected to uh, other approaches uh, where uh, we try to solve internal fixed points, initialize with solutions at previous parallel iterations, all this in an attempt to kind of uh, use uh, previous information in order to, to get uh, better accuracy in the fine solver. And uh, also in a similar spirit, I guess uh, we can say that some strategies to solve optimal control problems with parallel uh, can also enter into, into this framework. And uh, strategies such as the one presented by, um, by Felix uh, in his talk about the uh, two-level uh, parallel somehow can be read uh, a bit in, in, in these kind of terms too. Um, so um, I guess uh, this concludes the, the first part of my talk on the, the limitations of the parallel algorithm, how to try to push the limits uh, of its efficiency and uh, view all this uh, also in terms of, uh, of target accuracy that uh, one would like to get. Um, eventually, I think the, the algorithm is uh, never going to achieve perfect scalability and therefore uh, this uh, second part on the strategies in which uh, we could hope to see um, time as a parameter and therefore build very quick mappings uh, in which for a given time I give you the solution very quickly and, uh, and in a parallel fashion for different, diff different times. So the first uh, strategy uh, that I have selected is this Cauchy integration formula. Uh, I'm going to discuss this for parabolic problems only for the following reason I'm, I'm going to, to, to say along the discussion. So here in this setting, in fact, we can consider a special domain that is even very high dimensional. So suppose this is a domain omega uh, as a tensor product of uh, omega one. Suppose this is uh, one direction, uh, omega d, uh, the, the d uh, coordinate. And suppose we have an elliptic operator uh, that uh, comes as a tensor product of uh, some uh, elliptic operators AI. Suppose AI is in fact an operator that goes from H1 omega I to uh, its dual. Okay, so and uh, one uh, easy example is to take uh, this AI as uh, like the, the, the second partial derivative uh, which would lead in fact to an operator A that is simply the Laplacian. Okay, so let us take the Laplacian as a guiding example, but uh, we, we could consider uh, other types of uh, elliptic uh, operators like this. 
And now consider that uh, we have to uh, solve this uh, parabolic problem dTU plus our elliptic operator A minus the Laplacian U equals uh, F. Uh, as we have seen already in other talks, in fact, uh, there is uh, one uh, very appealing uh, way of viewing the solution to this problem, uh, which is, oh, sorry, here I, I forgot that this is not a zero. As an initial condition, I'm taking this as a U zero, okay? Uh, the Cauchy formula is going to give us uh, uh, an expression for the solution to this equation for all time t. And it is based on uh, applying exponential operators involving our uh, diffusion operator applied to the initial condition u0 and uh, this other uh, operator, which is also an, an exponential, uh, applied to uh, the, the right hand side. So it's uh, the backbone of uh, the family of approaches uh, on exponential in time integrators, as we saw in uh, Maya's talk and uh, Martin's talk. And uh, let us uh, recall where this comes from, although uh, Martin already gave a glance to this. So this Cauchy integral formula uh, comes, uh, first of all, from, I mean, it's a generalization of the Cauchy formula in the complex plane for a, for a simple function. Okay, so let us recall this. Suppose there's a function C, uh, F, sorry, that goes from the complex plane to the complex plane. It gives us only complex number numbers, suppose this f is holomorphic, then it, mean, uh, it means that in fact I can evaluate f at every point z as the integral along a certain curve of my function f of zeta divided by zeta minus z. And uh, this uh, curve uh, has to somehow satisfy certain conditions, but uh, we are not going to discuss this here. The point I want to draw is that uh, this is a very famous formula that we all learn at school and then it turns out that it can be somehow extended to operators. So now take H a Hilbert space and A a linear operator uh, on this Hilbert space. Then we can define the action of a function f. f, suppose here f is the exponential, okay, here we can define the exponential of z. I'm telling you now that we can define the exponential uh, of uh, my operator A, which is unfortunately here it's a T by mistake. <laughs> A is equal to T. So uh, F uh, exponential of my operator is the integral also along a curve in the complex plane uh, in which, uh, so I, I evaluate the function F uh, on complex numbers now, so I use somehow this, this version of the function, and then I, I uh, have to solve z minus my operator inverse. Of course, in fact, uh, this bit here has to be invertible uh, for uh, all the z's that uh, are going to take values uh, in my rectifiable curve. Therefore, this means that in fact, uh, these z's uh, uh, cannot, they are not allowed to be uh, eigenvalues of the operator because otherwise eigenvalue minus uh, the operator is uh, equal to zero. This is non-invertible and therefore this has no meaning. Uh, why I am insisting on this? It is because now I want to apply this to the function exponential of minus a time times z and uh, with uh, the linear operator taken here as, uh, as the minus Laplacian to connect it with uh, our uh, parabolic problem. If I do this, uh, I, I take again the, the formula uh, for, for my u and now I am in, in shape to somehow express this as uh, with the Cauchy integral formula as I have done over here and therefore I have to uh, solve uh, z plus uh, the Laplacian inverse applied to u0. Okay, so this means that I have to solve for a bunch of z's z plus the Laplacian, uh, the identity plus the Laplacian of some unknown function f 
equal to u0 for all z in my curve gamma. Therefore, this z, it cannot, it is forbidden that it is in the spectrum of my operator, in fact. And why the hell am I, go, uh, am I sure that this is going to be the case? Okay, and so the m kind of trick is that for uh, these uh, symmetric uh, operators that are elliptic, in fact, the spectrum is uh, real and positive. <coughs> Therefore, I know if I position myself in the complex plane, I know that there's going to be uh, lambda 1. So the eigenvalues are going to be over here. And I can always uh, find this kind of curve gamma that never touches uh, the positive real axis in order to do my integration. Therefore, in fact, it is a safe operation because I know very well information, crucial information about my operator. So thanks to this, in fact, uh, uh, then uh, the, the problem uh, somehow becomes very easy because in order to do a numerical scheme, what do I have to do? I have to integrate over this curve. Therefore, I, I just uh, do a simple quadrature. I replace this by quadrature points. Uh, ZQ are the, the uh, sorry, uh, quadrature weights, omega Q, uh, quadrature points, ZQ. And uh, I have to solve this problem for a bunch of ZQs. And uh, similarly for, for the second part of the equation. So this has a bunch of nice consequences. If, if you think about it, in fact, solving this problem for a bunch of ZQ, it's trivially parallelizable. Trivially parallelizable. Time here is a parameter. It uh, enters uh, only in the formula through this exponential of minus t. And so this is like the perfect dream for a parallel in time scheme, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, so each static problem, this, these problems can be computed in parallel. So let us continue with the nice consequences over here. So in fact, I have easy control on accuracy because as uh, Martin uh, explained, in fact, uh, I know that uh, if I do a trapezoidal rule uh, to, as, a, as a quadrature integration, in fact, I have uh, exponential uh, accuracy. Uh, I have spectral accuracy in, in the approximation. Also, I can control the accuracy at which I am solving these bits over here. Therefore, I have a full control on the accuracy. And uh, note that, in fact, we need to repeatedly solve a bunch of elliptic problems. This is a very favorable situation to use model order reduction. So on top of it, I can not only parallelize every bit of it, but I can even speed up every tiny bit thanks to strategies such as model order reduction. And in addition, if uh, the operator has a certain um, structure, uh, this, uh, this approach uh, fights very well against the curse of dimensionality. And this is the case, for example, when uh, we have uh, an initial condition that comes in a tensorized form. I'm not going to discuss this further, but so this becomes extremely neat. And uh, we can consider extremely high dimensional problems also in space. So I think that overall, if you have a, a parabolic problem, just forget about parareal. Just do this. It's uh, extremely, extremely um, um, accurate. Uh, uh, we've discussed a lot about the pros, perfectly scalable, beats the cost of dimensionality in certain settings. It's possible to use model order reduction. Let me come to the, co uh, to the negative side. In fact, in my view, but, uh, Martin uh, is maybe not uh, entirely, uh, doesn't entirely agree. <laughs> so as soon as the setting becomes more involved, uh, this approach can still be applied, but it becomes, again, a time-stepping method somehow. We can no longer really see time as a perfectly as a parameter, and we are going to fall back again to limitations connected to time-stepping schemes. So in my view, 
uh, there's this uh, approach doesn't provide a perfect solution for transport dominated problems, for example. And um, what can we do for other types of problems is the very last part of the talk. And I will devote a uh, little time to it because I guess it's uh, um, not really connected to, to our community. Uh, so I am going to discuss a recent work on model order reduction for conservation laws. Uh, and there I am going to see time as a parameter and with a quick mapping from time to the solution. This is one possible solution to the problem of parallel in time. I'm, I'm not saying uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, the ultimate silver bullet because uh, we need a learning phase. So uh, what's uh, the approach in, in a few words, because I am running out of time. Um, I apologize, there's going to be a slight change in notation in the meaning of certain letters. Uh, consider a parametric uh, partial differential equation. The operator is going to be P here. And uh, so we are following notation from uh, machine learning, therefore, in fact, the solution to the PDE is going to be Y. It is going to be the output and X is going to be a bunch of parameters. And so I see X as my input and Y as my output. Therefore, the motivation to use this notation. Uh, R is going to be uh, the, the special, uh, the, co the, the notation for, for, the, for the coordinates in space or time. Here, uh, they note it as omega. Um, I am uh, so my, my parameter x, we are going to view this uh, simply as a vector of parameters. Okay, for example, think about uh, the Navier-Stokes equation and suppose that the Reinhold's number is one parameter that, uh, I don't know, uh, other, we, we can have uh, other types of parameters and I am going in addition to see time as one of, of the parameters. We are going to assume that this belongs to a certain compact set of values <coughs> and I am interested in the mapping taking uh, me from these parameters to the solution y of x. And I am going to define the solution set of all my y of x when uh, x takes values in uh, my uh, uh, range of uh, parameter values. Okay, so here, my vector of parameters, the Reinhold number is going to range between uh, 10 and uh, 1 million. Time is going to be between 0 and 10, and so on and so forth. And this is the meaning of this capital X here. So the goal in model order reduction is to find a very quick approximation to, to this mapping that I'm going to call here approximation A, that takes us from the parameter to an A of X, which has to approximate my solution Y of X. So the easy setting in model order reduction is when the PDE is elliptic or parabolic because in this case I know that I can pose uh, the solution, I can view the solution in a certain Hilbert space calligraphic Y and I can uh, use linear subspaces of uh, my ambient space in order to uh, take my approximate mapping A, A of X as uh, elements that are in my linear subspace uh, Vn, in my linear subspace Vn. So I in order to somehow summarize the situation, we can consider, for example, this is the manifold set of solutions, U of Y, when the parameters take a certain amount of values. Each point here is a solution Y for some parameter X which is going to be in a certain Hilbert space, suppose here H1 of omega or something like that, okay? And so uh, the classical approach in model order reduction is to say, okay, I approximate this manifold, which is in H1, by a linear subspace. This is a linear subspace Vn. And for every parameter that I am given, in fact, uh, this community has a very, um, efficient ways of uh, approximating every y of x here by something that is close uh, to y of x and that is in this, in this space. Okay, and the dimension of this space, 
for elliptic problems, it is small, and therefore, in fact, uh, it, uh, it, it, it end up ends up in very, very quick mappings from parameter to solution. The problem is for uh, transport-dominated problems. In fact, uh, the approach with the linear space is uh, just not going to work. And um, so we, we, I am currently doing a lot of works on how to extend this, and uh, the focus here is going to be on conservation laws, where in fact the ambient space uh, in which uh, we are going to work here is uh, the Wasserstein space of probability measures. So why uh, this choice and uh, what are the consequences is what I would like to outline uh, in, in, in this uh, last part. So let me first introduce what is this uh, Wasserstein space and why is this maybe a good choice as an ambient space for model order reduction. So um, this is a very technical slide. Uh, I, uh, the, the Wasserstein space is an idea in which if I have a, an ambient coordinate space omega with a certain distance, um, then I can consider the set of probability measures defined uh, on, on this domain. And the Wasserstein space is, uh, is a space of all these uh, probability measures and we can endow it with the notion of distance. Uh, that uses the uh, metric uh, from the ambient space. Okay, so it is defined through this formula, but frankly, it is completely irrelevant. The point is that I have an ambient space omega, I define the set of probability measures, and then I can somehow define a notion between probability measures in this space. Why is this interesting for our purposes? Uh, consider, uh, w forget about this picture, consider even this, even this uh, setting which is even simpler. Consider this a function u1, a function u2, both functions uh, they integrate to 1, therefore they can be considered as probability measures because they integrate to 1. Okay, so I, I want to define a notion of distance between these two measures. Uh, if I consider the L2 distance between them, in fact, the distance is going to be of order 1, regardless of how far apart they are going to be. But uh, in the Wasserstein uh, metric, in fact, the distance between these two measures is going to be exactly equal to the translation factor T or, uh, I don't know, uh, t, t, t is time, it's a bad notation, tau. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the distance between these two measures. And why is this relevant for us in model order reduction? It is because uh, transport-dominated problems, they transport this kind of uh, discontinuities in time, in certain privileged directions, and therefore when I do a reconstruction, in fact, I want to know very precisely if I am locating appropriately the position of the shocks. Therefore, if this would be like the, the true solution that I have to approximate, if I produce an approximation which is here, it is uh, the Wasserstein distance is going to tell me, hey, you are really very far apart. You have to do better use with your approximation in order to come closer. Okay, so this was like the main motivation that drove our choice. And uh, thanks to this, I, am, I have run out of time, therefore I will conclude, but thanks to this, uh, by putting ourselves in this kind of setting, we can uh, build model order reduction approaches that uh, are uh, rather promising. I would just like to conclude with this picture. Here's uh, the reference solution of a Berger's equation at a certain time. Time is a parameter here. Here is the approximation that we obtain uh, with uh, our procedure eventually. So you can see that uh, it's, uh, it's very accurate and, um, and uh, it's uh, not working for absolutely all problems that you're going to throw to me but uh, we consider that uh, these are kind of steps forward in, in, uh, in, in this um, 
uh, in this uh, topic. So with this, I am going to conclude and I, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks for a really fascinating talk, Olga. Do we have any questions? I don't know why I came down to the front. <laughs> Hi, Olga, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I had a few questions. Uh, the first one, just refreshing my memory on the Kochi contour integrals. On the first, sorry? The, my first question is just refreshing my memory on the Kochi contour integrals. Yeah. Uh, so if you're, if you're applying it to a linear operator, what does your contour have to contain? My, my uh, like so for oh, a function so, uh, so for a function you have to contain like a singularity right you have to go around it but but for a function do you have to contain like all the eigenvalues or something yes, bigger than that so the, exactly yeah so that that's the problem your formula here requires in fact uh, <coughs> what it means uh, in fact here wh what it means is that um, z here is not allowed to take the uh, the value of an eigenvalue right but but could it take, like, I guess that's what I'm wondering, is that if you have a discrete operator, you could make a million curves that contain none of the eigenvalues yes. and, and go around one of them or something. Yes, uh, the formula is independent of your choice of, uh, of, the, of the Jordan curve. Is it? Because for, cause for like, a, like, you don't have to, you can, you can put it anywhere you want. You don't have to go yes. around anything. Yes, yes, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Mm. So, oh. so this, uh, this is uh, the, the real point why I think that uh, using this formula is very dangerous when you go outside of uh, the setting of uh, uh, an elliptic operator because you no longer really know where your spectrum is lying and uh, it, it becomes an extremely dangerous activity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Um, and then, so on the optimal transport, I was just, uh, we didn't, we didn't have time to get through the yeah, details of sorry. it. Yeah, no, sorry. Are, are you using it as, like, are you actually using the optimal transport to find an approximate solution almost in a discretization sense? I am, I, uh, the approximation uh, is uh, through uh, Barry centers. Yeah, so, so you're kind of minimizing, or you're solving this optimal transport over the Barry centers to get your approximate solution. Exactly, okay. yes, yes. Interesting. So um, I, I, I just have a quick question. So you've mentioned a couple of times that you want to treat time as a parameter and you to contrast this to doing like normal time stepping. Yeah. I, I haven't really picked up what you mean by treating time as a parameter. So maybe you could just elaborate on this real quick. Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, um, what I meant by this is uh, that I don't, uh, if I want the final time, for example, I don't need to evaluate anything for previous times uh, in, order to, in order to get my solution. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so somehow I'm breaking uh, this uh, problem about uh, the sequential nature of time. So an approach that, uh, that uh, if I ask for the final time, that uh, I mean I can run this computation independently as a computation for an intermediate time without having to make them depend on each other. Is, does, does this make sense or no? Yes, I, I understand. But Sorry. Yes, I, I understand the aim you're formulating. I'm still having a hard time digesting this, but I understand the aim. So yeah, this clarified my question. So Thank you. Yeah, yes. So if you think about it, this, uh, this Cauchy integral formula is for me like the real paradigm that, uh, that does it in the sense that, okay, forget about this integral for a second. If, if we didn't have a right-hand side, this would be uh, the, what you have to do in your algorithm. Therefore, you can compute these bits independently of time and therefore for every different time, you just have to evaluate this little bit and then assemble everything. This independently of uh, 
uh, relying on solutions from previous times, so to speak. You, you, do, you, do you see what I mean? Okay. So, so there's a fascinating relation to semigroups and these things. So here, just you shouldn't see time anymore here. It's uh, just take semigroup operator theory and then then just use some standard mathematics, and that's what's done here. So it's not really time anymore in there actually. So mm. that's the that's the different kind of thinking you can apply here as well. That's why it works actually. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I had one question on each section, and I have to get to the first section. You mentioned at the end of the adaptive parallel that you only, the only, only the cost of the last fine propagation counts. Yes. And I didn't understand that. Uh, it was not really explained uh, uh, in depth in the talk. Uh, I, I should have given you the... There it's about increasing the accuracy uh, of, uh, of your fine uh, right. solves. And uh, when, when you do the computation, in order to, in order to make this algorithm converge, uh, then um, somehow you, you need rules for this uh, zeta k to be, say, just for the sake of the argument, 2 to the minus k or something like that. Yeah. And therefore, when you, if uh, you say now that the cost of the algorithm is inverse proportional. But uh, so that's, that's where it gets really tricky because uh, the, the. You need, you need, a, yeah, you, you need a, some sort of oracle, at least in the analysis, to say if I ask for this target accuracy, um, what is an estimation of the cost I am going to pay? This is actually relatively easy to do. I mean, uh, a first rule of thumb is that if, if you have a first order time integrator, the, the accuracy is inverse proportional. I mean, the cost is inverse proportional to the accuracy. Right, this is uh, oh, just sure. because yeah. when- just, just for a linear- Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so in fact, these kind of oracles are relatively easy, at, at least when you, when you need to do some kind of analysis, a priori analysis. So, so this is the result and the claim is following this kind of reasoning that I did not explain in the talk. And so you see that if, if, if we accept this as, uh, for, for the computation, then I, I have to compute, uh, to get the final cost, I have to compute this across all iterations and therefore I mean the last one is really going to give you the I mean the, the last one is uh, going to dominate <coughs> yes yeah that, okay that makes sense it's 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 much more subtle when you start using preconditioners and things like that to do your solves uh, in that it it, it's probably not only the last one you care about. I think that's. I, I guess. Uh, I mean, uh, the oracle that you need here is probably yeah. difficult to, to know a priori. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. I think it's coffee now. So let's thank Olga again for, for a great talk. Thank you.